Gordon Cosby may be the most influential pastor that you've never heard of. Having grown up in and around looking at churches most of my life now, I found him early. He established a church by the name of the Church of the Savior in Washington, D.C. And it was in the late 1940s, one of the first interracial churches in the still segregated area of the District of Columbia. Cosby died only three years ago at age 95. It's not only his work as a pastor that we remember, but also his commitment to social change. I think of him because of all the times we might need a voice in our world, Gordon Cosby's voice would be a good one. However, he tells of a time early in his ministry when The deacons came to him. They had been worried about a lady in the church who who was a widow with six children and was giving weekly $4 in the offering. The deacons suggested after meeting that they would think it would be a good idea if, in fact, one of them, in particular him, (laughs) went to her And you'll see his picture here, I think, in just a moment. That is Gordon Cosby. He said, go to her and explain to her that she could probably use that $4 some other way better for her life. And so he did. Being a young pastor, he made his way to her home and told her that the deacons had asked me to inform you that you probably could use your $4 a better way. She looked at him with grave concern and said you are tracking you're trying to take away the last thing that gives me dignity and meaning what she was saying is something i've learned a long time ago and that is that giving is a benefit for the giver it always is we kind of play games with that in the church particularly but giving always brings a significant benefit to the giver matter of fact science is even telling us this even though charitable giving is increased in the world today guess where it has decreased every research i looked at this week church giving is down across the board why because there are less people going to church and there are certainly more skepticism about churches in general but there's an article in New York Times sometime back, give if you know what's good for you. And it's filled with research regarding this whole issue of how we benefit literally from giving. The research says that by embracing a spirit of generosity, our lives will not only be enhanced, in other words, our heart will not only be warmed because of it, but we will in fact be healthier because of it. Now, whenever I talk about the whole issue of giving, whether it's giving your time, your talents, your financial, whatever it might be, whenever I talk about that, I remind folks of a couple things. 450 passages in the Bible deal with the issue of money. One-sixth of the statements that Christ made while on planet Earth was about money and that Christ saved his most scathing words for two issues, and those were money and marriage. Walter Brueggemann, who is a scholar and a theologian, talks about the tension between what we know as a the truth of abundance and the myth of scarcity. And he juxtaposed those against each other because he knows that we deal with this all the time. The reality, he says, of a drought or a famine or some other cause creates a kind of a sense of scarcity in us. Scarcity, a deep, fearful, anxious conviction that we will not have enough to go around. And the proper response to this anxiety is to keep everything that you have and to get protection against those that might take it from you and to take more steps, in fact, at the expense of others. But he says the myth of scarcity must be overcome because it, in fact, leads to greed. And he argues that on this myth of scarcity that we ought to balance it by balancing it with what he calls a lyric of abundance. 
And he says how we do that is this. We balance our sense of scarcity with a lyric of abundance when we, in fact, talk about the nature of the God that we worship. In other words, if you and I want to get an understanding about how it is that we need to relate to our, the giving of our time, our talents, and our resources, then we need to understand why we worship, who we worship, and the nature of the God that we worship. Because if, in fact, he is worthy of our worship, then we need to know and to understand and to identify and to connect and to reflect God's nature. That's what we're going to do over the next few moments. We're going to surround ourselves with this whole issue of treasuring Christ. First of all, if you got your folder want to follow along, treasuring Christ will lessen our fear. This issue of scarcity, this fear, this anxiety, treasuring Christ will lessen our fear. Luke says very clearly, chapter 12, verse 32, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Now, there are five things packed in that little verse. I mean, you can just walk around that and spend about a day and a half if you want to. But there are five things that are packed in there to help you and I understand that treasuring Christ will take away your fear. Why? Look at the verse. Do not be afraid, little flock. You see God as our shepherd. Do not be afraid, little flock. In other words, he is our shepherd. Luke says, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father. God is also our father. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. God is seen as a king. Best of all, God is seen as generous to give you the kingdom. And if, if that's not enough, look what else is remaining in that verse. Not being afraid shows us that we treasure that God brings us a kind of holy contentment. And that's why he uses the word gladly there. Your father has chosen gladly. Now, if you're a reader of Luke, you know that earlier in, in this section here, you know that he uses a very important word, a word my mother told me never to use. You do not call another person a fool. Now, I found that interesting. My mom would cuss, could cuss better than a sailor, and she could cuss a way out of that, that, that really fool would have sounded good in light of some of the things my mother would say. I see Jackie shaking her head. My Jackie knew my mother very, very well. Mom could lay it out. But you don't call anybody a fool, is what she said to us. But here a fool is a person who does not have what I would call a soul. The soul is that part of you that's most like God, that is connected to God, and that in fact will be with you forever. And if you and I believe in an afterlife, and we do, that that part of us, that soul, will be connected to us for eternity. Someone asked me about a certain person the other day, and I, I just kind of reflected, well, I'm a little uncomfortable. They have a little bit of a hole in their soul. And what I was saying is they just live for themselves right now because if they lived, if they have a soul that they understand and it is God-like, we live in such a way that honors us over the long haul. First of all, treasuring Christ will lessen our fear. Secondly, it will simplify our stuff. Luke says, sell your possessions, give to charity, make yourselves money belts which do not wear out, an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near nor moth destroys. Now what does that mean? He doesn't mean that he sell all your possessions, although he did that sometimes, didn't he? Look at it. So he just knew that there were certain people that had such a block with their possessions that he would speak to them. How about the people he said that to? Well, the rich young ruler, sell everything. He knew that that was such a block in his life that in order to get his attention, in order to get his life prioritized, that was what was going to take place. How about Zacchaeus? Look, look, Lord, here I am. Give half of my possessions to the poor, to the poor, and I have cheated, and anybody I've cheated, I will pay back four times. 50% of his, he knew that there was an amount that he needed to give. Barnabas, what did he do? He sold a field. I don't know how much or how many it needs to happen to you, but it needs to happen to all of us that we 
accumulate less and simplify more, which allows us to be in the business of simplifying and serving and giving, and those are good things. I don't think a lot of Jesus' disciples were on the high end of life. And so there were occasions where he said, you may need to go sell something in order to get some cash in order to do what you really need to do. There's a grain elevator who was a manager oversaw his grain elevator business, and he, uh, it was a very interesting story that his church came to him and asked him to be the treasurer of the church. It was a fairly small church, but he was a highly respected and trusted man in the community, and so they came to him and said, would you serve as the treasurer? And he said, I will do that under two, two reasons. I will, if you do not ask me to give you a report for the first year, and you do not ask me any questions about the finances for a year, I will do that. Now, you know, some of them said, whoa, wait a minute here. Uh, we le- need to at least know a little bit what's going on. He says, if you trust me, then trust me. And, of course, there weren't a whole lot of people to do it, so they trusted him. And they said for 12 months, he didn't say anything. Until the end of those 12 months, he came forward. He says, the church's indebtedness of $150,000 has now been paid off. He says, there are no outstanding bills. Staff salaries have been increased by 9%. And we now have a cash balance of almost $15,000. And they looked at him and said, how in the world could you do that? And the grain elevator man said this. Most of you bring your grain to my elevator. During the year, I've held 10% of what you brought and gave it to the church in your name. You never missed it, and now you see what happened. I will be back at the back door with the grain elevator ready when you leave today. Everybody counts. Of all the things that I need to say to you, everything we do, how we live, how we serve, how we simplify, how we give, all that matters. You think not? Ask Andrew Johnson. You can't until the afterlife. But Andrew Johnson was not convicted of violating the tenure of the Office Act, which would have resulted in his impeachment by one vote. One more presidential example. Rutherford B. Hayes became the 19th president by one vote in 1876. Now you say, well, those are old things. Well, how about 1994 in the Wyoming election, House of Representatives, represented, uh, Republican Representative Randall Luthi and Independent Larry Call finished exactly tied. How did they solve it? Well, they took a cowboy hat and they put a ping pong ball in it and they pulled out a ping pong ball Luthi not only won the election because of that choice, but he later became Speaker of the House. It matters what we do and what we choose. Thirdly, treasuring Christ will maximize our destiny. In other words, selling your possessions and giving to charity, he says, make yourselves money belts which do not wear out an unfailing treasure where no thief comes nor moth destroys. There's a connection between the simplifying of our lives for the sake of maximizing our destiny. You're going to see, uh, they didn't have, uh, this was the best iPhone picture I could get of Jonathan Edwards. You'll see his picture here in just a moment. But Jonathan Edwards, you know they didn't have pictures back then. But we've been studying Jonathan Edwards on Wednesday nights. And for those of you who've been studying, you know that he was a part of the uh, Great Awakening. And what I did not know, and I'd studied him before, was that not only was he uh, quite spiritual, strong, vibrant, but he also was quite a scholar. He studied a lot. And matter of fact, later became the president at Princeton. But what I found about it was he kind of went against the grain of, you've heard that quote, don't be so heavenly minded, you are no earthly good. By the way, that probably comes from a scripture, um, Colossians 3, set your mind on things above, not on the things of earth. But what I was attracted to about him is that he had the full package. He had his mind and he had his heart and he had a fervor about his life. At the end of our service today, we take what we call is a benevolence offering. And that benevolence offering is given, in fact, to give to people who have immediate needs or that are within our community. And I would simply remind you that that allows me to give to people immediately. And sometimes I find out that it, they didn't treat it nice. The fact that we treasure it does not mean that they will treasure it, but does it mean we need to give 
less because of that. No, our responsibility is, in fact, to give. Treasuring Christ will lessen our fear. It will simplify the stuff that we deal with. It will, in fact, maximize our destiny. But best of all, treasuring Christ will clarify your affections. Luke says, for where your treasure is, there will be your heart. That's the thing we know. We've heard over and over again. Luke really clarifies that later in chapter 16 when he says, no servant can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. And so he basically is saying that to serve money is to cherish money and to pursue all the benefits that come from money. But to serve God means to cherish God and to pursue all the benefits that come from him. There is a Methodist pastor that I've watched through the years. You'll see his picture in just a moment, Will Williman. He's been a pastor. He's been, um, and he's connected with the Methodist church, so that means he could serve uh, as chaplain at Duke. Uh, how a man could do that under God, I don't know. But he did that, and uh, from there he was a bishop in the Methodist church and all kinds of things. But He's an interesting guy, but he tells this story, and it's one that's kind of been clinging to me. As I knew we would come to the end of this series, I knew it would kind of consummate today with the Lord's table. I thought, what an opportunity. And hear his story. Methodist churches, I did not know, but I have Methodists in my uh, family tree, but I did not know that many of them do what I'm going to be asking you to do today. He says... One of his favorite times as pastor is when my people, he say, come forward at Holy Communion, streaming down the altar, and there they hold out their empty hands like little children, like the famished folk they really are, empty, needing a gift in the worst sort of way. He says, I think that is one of the most difficult countercultural gestures of Christian worship. In other words, what he's saying is for those of us who are independent American types, it is awfully hard for us to come to God with our hands up. We don't mind shaking hands. We already got one free here. We don't, we don't mind extending a hand, but, but to offer empty hands is a powerful gesture. So today we're going to do our communion a little differently. I'm going to give you really good instructions so you don't have to worry, so just know that. These wonderful little things that will touch the bread here will protect any of you who feel uneasy about somebody handing you a piece of bread. I talked with our deacons about this the other day, and I immediately had one of them say, I'm not a dipper. And I said, well, we're going to see how many of our folks are. There is something powerful about you and I coming to this table, holding our hands up, and waiting for somebody to drop it in there. And to look at it and to think what it really means. That she has just given me, symbolically, yet powerfully, the body of Christ. And then by then dipping it in the juice... Not my fingers, just the bread. And by receiving that, I'm taking what God said seriously. So, I'm going to ask that you do exactly that in just a moment. If you're here and you're not a member of our congregation, that is not the bottom line. The bottom line is, are you a follower of Christ? And if you have, in fact, accepted Christ, then we want you, he invites you to come to this table. Now, the easiest way is for us to come out into this center aisle from this section and to walk down and then to go back that side and to go in there. Same thing here, come down here and maybe kind of just circle back or go around the back and come in there. I think you'll figure it out. I'm not worried about that part of it. Now, for those of you who are just, I don't dip. Right here you have bread that you personally can pick up, and here's juice that you personally can drink. Just come here and then go up the other way. 
I don't want the mechanics to confuse you. I want the mechanics to empower you. So come. Come. Empty hands. For I received from the Lord that which I delivered to, the Lord, to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which you betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and the supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We will do this together, but individually. Let's pray together. Father, it is our hope and our prayer that during these moments, we won't get tied up into the difference of the movement of what we do today but that we will concentrate on one thing and one thing alone. That we are picking up a piece of bread that tells us that your body was given for us. And that we are going to dip that in the juice to remind us that it was not an empty body. It was a body pulsing with blood that cost you your life. And as much as there is a goriness to that story, there is a glory to that story. And so we come to be your united, loving people. Be with us as we share in this powerful time. In Christ's name.